very much for joining our webinar um, in conjunction with Shield Safety today. Um, my name is Molly. I am Head of Communications for the BII and I um, head up the team here who look after all of our comms out to members. We've got some BII members joining us today, but also we have um, people who've been invited from Best Bar None. So welcome to all of you here and I hope that you enjoy the session. Um, I'm going to hand over shortly to um, Rob Easton from Shield Safety, who will be um, presenting today and taking you through several areas. And um, the theme for today's session is keeping your business open and trading safely. So obviously, we're not out of COVID yet, but we want to focus on lots of different areas that um, can be covered um, by health and safety now that we're in a, a slightly different world. Um, can I just ask everyone if they could keep their cameras turned off and muted for now? Um, if you do have any questions, then you can um, pop them in the chat box at the bottom of your screen um, and we'll pick those up at the end of the session, but hopefully it should be a really um, informative session. Then after we've had the session, we're recording this session, which hopefully you'll have all seen and, and accepted um, that, that uh, you're happy for us to do that. We'll be hosting this online so that anybody who does miss it, if you've got any colleagues that want to catch up on the session afterwards, we'll be sharing that as well. And then we'll also send an email out to everybody um, with a link to the free risk assessment um, that SHIELD are, are providing for us as well. Um, so I think that covers all housekeeping, um, but I will hand over to Rob, who will uh, now start the presentation for us. Thank you, Rob. That's fantastic. Thank you, Molly. So what I'm going to do is that dreaded screen share to begin with. So I'm hoping now if um, hopefully you can all see that. Molly, perhaps if you can give me a thumbs up, if you can see that. OK, I can see that. OK, thank you Amazing. very much. There we go. Well, I've passed the first test. So uh, Molly, thank you um, for the invite to uh, to speak today. Uh, you know, I really relish the chance to, to talk with members of the BII and, and others. Um, so just to introduce myself, uh, I'm Rob Easton. I'm the head of consultancy at Shield Safety Group. I'll talk a little bit more about Shield Safety in a moment. Um, but just to give you an idea of my background, I'm a chartered environmental health practitioner, um, having worked in the, the private and public sector, both in the UK and abroad. Um, much of my time um, over those many years has been supporting pubs, restaurants, hospitality venues, breweries and the like. Um, uh, and indeed, I've been an operator myself. I think my first kitchen job was at the age of 12, completely illegal, um, but it was different times. So uh, as I'm talking today, I'll be talking as a chartered environmental health practitioner, a consultant who supports businesses, but also hopefully I can bring the insight and understanding from my time in operations as well. So uh, what we'll be covering off today is uh, an introduction to Shield Safety, just who we are and what we do. Uh, talk about COVID controls, you know, what stay, what goes, what's enhanced. Um, and I'll do that as a summary and I'll introduce the risk assessment that Molly just uh, mentioned earlier. Talk about the wider safety implications. So, yeah, we've been talking about COVID now for it feels like ever. But when we're talking about COVID, what aren't we talking about? What is what has dropped off our radar? I think it's just as important to, to have a reminder there and, and talk about the other things we should be interested in. Learnings from the last 18 months, um, it, it, the, um, the technology approaches to safety, how we're managing businesses, you know, it's rapidly accelerated. So I think it would be good to reflect on what's happened in the last 18 months and what should businesses be looking to continue doing. And then if we've got enough time, um, I'd like to cover off allergens and I'll, I'll do that briefly. I'm aware there's a number of slides there, but I think I'll cut that back because because there's, there's already quite a lot to cover. So that, that's the cunning plan for our session this morning. Um, so let's introduce Shield Safety. Um, so who are we? Shield Safety Group, uh, we're one of the leading safety providers in the UK. As it says here, we've been trading since 2013 with the largest employer of environmental health practitioners uh, in the country. Um, that also means we're the largest trainer of environmental health practitioners. And, and indeed, they'll be up and down the country today, supporting large and small clients with auditing, training uh, and consultancy needs. Um, who do we work with? Well, things we're particularly proud of, I'll just draw your eye to the, the bottom slide here. Uh, we've got primary authority status with Milton Keynes. That means we work closely with them and our members, our, our clients then uh, enjoy primary authority status. Uh, we're also working very closely at the moment with Food Standards Scotland and the Food Standards Agency, um, looking about how do we uh, review food enforcement in the UK and how do uh, organisations um, support businesses that therefore reduce the burden, the, the um, enforcement burden from local authorities. 
Uh, and here we go, just to introduce our cycle of continuous improvement on the right hand side. Um, this is how we bring about improvements in safety, culture and performance in businesses. And that's supporting with policies, risk assessments, training, supported by our safety advice line, which I know BII members have access to. So that's a, um, an advice line teamed by environmental health practitioners that can support with accident, incident investigations, alleged food poisonings, uh, insight into risk assessments. So that safety advice line there is, is available. And then uh, we then review our policies, risk assessments and training through ongoing monitoring, be it through diaries or our electronic monitoring app. Uh, we support with fire risk assessments. And as I've already mentioned, we've got our team of EHPs up and down the country, regularly auditing sites to make sure that they're maintaining the standards required. So that's a little bit about shield safety. If you want to find out more, then uh, I know we'll send a, there's a landing page going out to introduce the risk assessment, and I'm sure there's more details about us on there. So um, let's talk about COVID controls. Uh, as I say, this is a, a, a brief overview of, of what stays, what goes, and what's enhanced. Uh, I'm very aware that when I'm talking, um, this relates mostly to, to England, but what I'll be able to do is I'll, I'll highlight the differences with Scotland and Wales where I'm able to, and also where the guidance has been published. So um, what, what stays? Well, enhanced cleaning, well, that's yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah, that's no bad thing from an EHP's perspective. So there is this expectation of enhanced cleaning uh, and sanitization, particularly of, of uh, surfaces. Hand washing, again, the enhanced uh, hand washing, ensuring that hand wash provision is available and it's fully stocked. And then that's supported by hand sanitizers uh, where the risk assessment uh, defines them. Managing an outbreak. So there is still a, there are still cases. We know that we I think it was 30,000, about 30,000 yesterday confirmed cases of uh, COVID. So that means there are outbreaks happening. And indeed, the biggest impact on businesses now, and we're seeing this, is when there is an outbreak in a business, that's impacting the availability of the, of the team. And therefore, the business is having to close. Having just reopened your doors and welcomed back the great British public, then it's about managing that outbreak. So there is the expectation of no notifying organisations if you've had cases and then making sure that you've got a single point of contact to liaise with the enforcement agencies. Um, so if uh, they can collect details from you, understand your risk assessment and the controls that are in place. Self-isolation, well, we know that's going to change shortly with the uh, the double jab, but there is still the requirement to self-isolate um, if uh, if a confirmed case of COVID and indeed for the time being until the, the double jab. And the, the timings are slightly different uh, for Scotland, Wales and England, and the requirements are slightly different, but there will be a, a uh, reduction in the burden to self-isolate, which I think we're all looking forward to, and I know will have a huge impact on on businesses. The the need for a risk assessment absolutely stays, and in fact, looking at the slide, we could have moved this over to the enhanced column because what we've seen in the latest guidance is a removal of the absolute requirements, um, and that's shifting over to the to the requirement to undertake a risk assessment, and that's why we're really keen to support you with the risk assessment that we've produced. So this has been produced by our team of environmental health practitioners. Yeah, you know, we've all been working with COVID, supporting clients uh, over the last eighteen months. Um, and recognising that increased need for risk assessment. That's why we thought it was so important to share that uh, and, uh, and and help you because it, it can be a little confusing. Um, I'm just aware there's someone in the um, waiting room, so I'm just going to admit them because it's popped up on my screen. So sorry if I was distracted there for a moment. Um, and then, of course, communication and training. That is an absolute backbone of all uh, health and safety legislation, and it's no different for COVID. So once you've undertaken your risk assessment, identified the controls that are required, then ensuring that those are communicated effectively to your team and that it's trained in. And of course, as always, it's about being able to demonstrate to an enforcing officer um, what, what that training is, the record of training. And particularly if there's an outbreak that you can demonstrate as a business, the controls that you've had in place and that the team understood fully what was uh, required of them. What I'd also include in there in the communication and training is communicating um, to your to your guests. So it's around guest expectation. Now that's not a requirement in uh, the guidance documents, but I think it's really important. What we've seen with COVID is an increase in aggression. You know, we've seen that particularly in our supermarket, in our, our retail clients, but also in hospitality. And that's where guests are visiting. Um, there's a mismatch between what they're expecting to, to have 
uh, and what they actually have. So it's about communicating beforehand with the guest. What is what are the controls in the business? What's different to maybe when they visited 18 months ago? Um, so that's not a, a requirement to communicate your risk assessment to the guest. But we would be advising to communicate the guest journey, the guest experience, because if you do that, that will reduce um, any or the likelihood of aggression where there is a disappointment from the uh, from the visitor. So that's what stays and obviously it has been slimmed down considerably. What goes? So uh, social distancing. So obviously we've heard about Freedom Day and Scotland have, uh, have announced that uh, all the enhanced controls are being dropped, Wales as well will be very shortly um, but there is still that requirement to reduce contact so we, we've heard about Freedom Day and that everything's you know it's everything's been thrown out but reading the guidance you will see, still see that there is a, a need where there is likelihood to be groups of people gathering it may be around a service point it may be around toilets that uh, you should risk assess that and reduce as much as possible uh, the contact between people. Mandatory mask wearing goes mostly, um, but obviously if you are in Wales and Scotland, you'll see that there are requirements in Scotland uh, for wearing of masks in hospitality um, uh, when standing um, is still there. In Wales, there is the need for mask wearing in enclosed spaces, but not in hospitality. Um, compulsory record recording of visitor details. Well, again, we've seen that in the uh, in England, but there still is the need to record it in Wales and Scotland. So if you're trading in those areas, it's important to make sure you understand what's happening in the devolved nations. And then the work from home, there's varying messages, but this is about getting people back to the workplace. I know that's particularly significant for those that are running businesses in and around city centres. Um, and I'm sure we're all going to welcome back the office workers and the, and the Friday afternoon drinks that that brings. And then the last one is that enhanced. And if you've read the guidance, there's a real shift in focus here. There's a real move to reviewing ventilation in the workplace. Um, and I'll be honest, it, um, we're all slightly confused where some of this guidance come, came from. It talks a lot about CO2 monitors, about the need to be doing a detection of um, carbon dioxide in the environment. That will give you an indication of whether an area is um, overly occupied if there's insufficient ventilation. Now, what I'd be saying is the first thing uh, any business should be doing is looking at their business, identifying areas that might be um, poorly ventilated. So that might be, for example, a manager's office. It might be you know, a back storage room. It might be the dry store. What areas of the business have poor ventilation? So they're, they're within the building. There's no form of mechanical ventilation. And then once you've identified those, those is can you increase the ventilation? Can you turn the fans up? Can an extra fan be fitted? And then if not, um, restricting access to that space. So rather than having all of the team, the chefs, the front of house and the manager's office at one time, it's actually saying it's poorly ventilated. So there should only be one or two people in here at any one time. Like I say, the guidance, talks an awful lot about CO2 monitors. I'll be interested to see people's views if they've, um, if they've used those, if they've implemented it. But our general view is we know when a, a room feels stuffy, you know when you walk in and you go, God, this, this feels uncomfortable, then that's a good indication that it's poorly ventilated. So that's that's just a brief overview of the COVID controls. Um, what we have done, as already mentioned, is we've produced this risk assessment support. So again, developed by our team of environmental health practitioners. And I believe that the link is being, if it's not being sent out already, that it's being sent out after this session. Um, and please download it, please use it. Um, this has been developed over the last 18 months. It's continually updated. I think we're probably on version eight or version nine. Um, and we would encourage you to use it and hopefully it supports making those those decisions that it feels a bit grey, it does feel a bit woolly um, because we've been used to absolutes in previous guidance, but what will, hopefully this risk assessment will support you uh, and help you make those decisions. So it's not my intention to talk much more about COVID um, at the moment, but what we can do is I'll pick up any questions or, or any thoughts that you have at the end of the session. So the next thing I'd like to move on to is talking about um, wider implications of safety. And this is this is in general terms. I'm not going to talk specifics around legislation and, and, and particular detail. But these are the things that, like we say, we haven't been talking about. Uh, and with the changes over the last 18 months, how has that impacted safety in the business? So um, the first thing that I want to talk about is resources and capabilities. Um, what we know when we investigate accidents, incidents, alleged food poisonings, often there's a mismatch 
between what the aspirations of a business are, what, what they want to do, what they want to offer to the guest and what they're capable of. Um, and, and you'll all be familiar with the many cases of food poisoning that happen in the summer when there's a wedding party of 100 and actually the pub only normally caters for 60 and they haven't got enough refrigeration and they haven't got enough team on. And that's a classic mismatch between resources and capabilities, the equipment, the staff available, the understanding of the, of the team and what they aspire to do to produce a, a wedding buffet for 100 people. And, and this year has been particularly interesting because there's been an impact on the resources and capabilities that are available in the team. So it's always been a problem, but the last 18 months has really expanded that and, and, and focused this as an issue. So what, what's happened? Well, the first thing is businesses have expanded their offer. We saw this occupation of outside spaces. We saw um, car parks being utilised. We saw beer gardens having marquees put up. And then suddenly a pub that maybe had 80 covers previously has got an extra 100 in the car park. It's got another 20 around the back. And, and we've now got a business that, that had 80, has now got 200. And a real concern, and we're seeing this, is um, as reopening, as the inside spaces opened up again, um, the businesses didn't contract. You know, they didn't remove the 100 in the car park. They thought, wow, this is fantastic. We've suddenly got an extra 100 covers. We've always wanted this. Um, and as the area, as parts become reopening, there's uh, areas of the business that simply cannot support that new expanded business. You know, the kitchen is only designed, let's say, to do 120 covers, 150 covers. You know, the ability of the team uh, to move around safely around the business is limited to, to, to what was inside and maybe the pub beer garden. So what we're saying is, you know, look carefully. And there is a temptation, and, and it's understandable that the, the trade has been seriously impacted. There is a temptation to say, fantastic, we've now got 200 covers. Let's make, you know, make money whilst the sun shines. But actually, can you do it safely? Uh, do all parts of your business support that expanded offer? Um, and if not, you know, there's one or two things, isn't there? You, you reduce your offer back to what you can deliver safely, or you look to increase your resources and capabilities, look at outside kitchen areas, look at more team joining, changing the menu slightly to make sure that you can safely cater for the number of guests that are now visiting. The next one we know is teams are disrupted, um, a huge disruption, be that through through COVID, be that um, through teams not being available, this, this brain drain that we've heard about of teams not returning to hospitality. Um, and, and again, it's looking and saying that teams are resources and capabilities. And if you normally have eight on a shift and only six are available, is making sure that you um, limit the offer, the service that's given to the guests. And I know I know this sounds really, really, really easy. Uh, oh, sorry, really straightforward, but it's not easy. <laughs> I recognise that. But it's about going, actually, what can we safely do with the number of people that we've got available to us? And again, that's uh, restricting the number of covers, looking at the menu that's on offer and making sure, again, that the resources and capabilities match what you're able to offer the guest. And then the last one to, to pick up on is supply chains are bumpy. Um, we're just about to do a, a blog on this on our website and we recognise that there are problems in the supply chain. There is limitations with drivers and we are hearing this from our clients and I'm sure most of you are experiencing it where ingredients are, are not being delivered, consumables are not being delivered um, and there is a real problem with the supply chain being bumpy. Um, and the problem that causes for safety are, are many. Well, the obvious one is you haven't got your cleaning chemicals, you haven't got the ingredients to sell. Um, what does that do? We call it the bullwhip effect. So as there's a small change in the supply, then operators um, and businesses, and they, they, this is a known phenomenon, is they compensate. So if your supply chain is bumpy on dairy, let's say, well, if you're holding five days worth of stock, let's hold six or seven or eight now, just to make sure we've always got the product. Now, there's obviously a problem with overstocking um, because now the, this product can go out of date. You won't be able to recognize if there's pest issues, um, that there's insufficient space to allow proper cleaning and, and um and cooling of food. So it's just for those that have got kitchen operations, it's just go in and review and make sure the kitchen team are not uh, overcompensating for a poor supply chain and overstocking, because that will cause other problems. The other uh, issue there is around substitution of goods, and particularly around allergens. 
So if uh, you've got your menu, you've got your specs, you've got your, your allergen matrix, if the supply chain is bumping, we're seeing a lot of substitutions coming through, is how do you make sure your allergen management and your matrix reflects the reality of your supply chain? So if there are substitutions, capturing them, seeing if there are allergens, and then making sure that that's updated on the specs and matrix. Yeah, it, it's a real challenge. Um, like I say, I, I make it sound so simple. I recognise it's not. It's really hard to, uh, to implement, but the reality is, is allergens kill um, and it's a significant risk. Then the other things around um, around the, the wider implications on safety is the last 18 months has seen some real entrepreneurial spirit within hospitality. We've seen uh, the growth of takeaways, we've, we've seen pop-up shops, yeah, we've seen changes in menu. It, it's just fantastic and shows the resilience and, and, and energy within the, um, within the profession. The challenge with that is, is uh, your food safety management system, the uh, registration that you have with the local authority. The EHO may have came out to see you three years ago, five years ago. And what's happened in the time from the last visit to this visit is your business may have changed fundamentally on the types of goods and products you offer and, and, and how you deliver them. So it's about going back and making sure that your food safety management system, your HACCP, reflects your operation. And we get it. You know, last year was it was about survival. It was about grabbing opportunities. But now it's going back and saying, OK, if we're continuing with that uh, offer, do our, does our documentation, does our training reflect what we're currently doing? And um, because it, it could be a heck of a shock when that EHO turns up, you've changed it incrementally. You know, you've made little tweaks as you go along. If the EHO hasn't seen you three, for three years. They go, wow, you've suddenly got 200 covers. You're doing a delivery service and you've got an outside barbecue. And, and you just need to make sure that you bring the EHO on your journey and communicate what you've done and how you're doing it safely. And then the last point there is um, moving on from EHOs is uh, they haven't inspected on the whole for the last 12, 18 months. The focus has been on COVID. The Food Standards Agency and Food Standards Scotland recognise this and there's plans about uh, the phased returns of EHOs. So they're concentrating now on newly opened businesses. Then they'll be moving to those with a poor uh, record previously. But if, if, if you're a good business uh, previously and five stars as an example, then it's a good chance you may not see an EHO for another 12, 12 months. Now, the problem with that is um, many organisations use the EHO as their independent verification. Am I doing badly or not? Which, of course, is it's a risky, uh, risky approach in the first place, because if you're found wanting, then it's a very public message about your performance and the, the scores on the doors will reflect that. So what I'd be encouraging is for those businesses is getting that independent pair of eyes, getting someone into your business that is not your manager, is not yourself to say, how are we performing? Because what that means is, when the EHOs do visit, you've got the business, you know you're on track, there's no nasty surprises. So like I say, it's, and obviously you know, I've talked about our auditing services, that is a way of that third party review of your business to ensure that you are meeting the standards and over time they haven't slipped or over time your food safety management system no longer reflects your operation now. So there's some wider implications on safety. Uh, again, what I'll do is I'll, I'll move on to the next slide, um, but I'd welcome questions at the end. So the last 18 months, um, what has it taught us? If any of you attended the R200 conference about, oh gosh, uh, eight weeks ago, I did a long session on this. I'm going to try and condense that long session down to about five minutes so you can tell me how I've done. Um, the first thing that the, the last 18 months has taught us is safety practitioners. Um, it often felt like we were, we, we were brought in at the very last moment. And I'll give you examples. We will get a phone call saying we're opening this new rooftop bar. It's going to be fantastic. There's a fire pit. There's a barbecue. Uh, there's a dance floor. Uh, it's going to be overlooking the city. It's amazing. Um, can you come and risk assess it? And we'll say, OK, yeah, we'd love to be involved. When are you opening it? Tomorrow. <laughs> and of course, at, at that point, as safety practitioners, um, it, it is done. The thing is built. Um, and it's a really uh, awkward situation because yeah, it, it, safety can be perceived as negative as being getting in the way because we would say, well, simply you, you cannot do what you've designed here or it doesn't meet the requirements. What we would say and, and what we've seen over the last 18 months is actually designing that guest journey, safety practitioners being um, involved right at the very beginning. And the fantastic thing about that is, is we can design the guest journey together. We can decide what that guest experience looks like and you can weave safety through it very subtly. 
Um, because if we come at the end, it's normally a very crude measure that we're left with is, well, I'm afraid that that doesn't that that's unsafe or, well, what you're going to have to do is provide signage or you're going to have to continue or someone saying, please be aware. But actually being involved in the design process, understanding what the business is trying to achieve is we can weave safety through it. We can make it subtle. We can ensure that there's nudges in there to, to have the behaviour that's desired without it shouting at the guest. Um, and of course, we had to do that with COVID because safety was was right at the forefront. So like I say, it's been it's been a great 18 months. I've seen many of my colleagues working with businesses, designing the guest journey, making the best experience that is possible. But like I say, but with safety, weave through it rather than this bolt on at the end when everyone panics and just says, well, just write a risk assessment and sort it. So I'd encourage you to, to engage with your safety practitioner, a safety practitioner, whoever it may be, but very early on um, when designing and thinking about new guest experiences. The other thing is review crisis management plans. Again, businesses really struggle with this um, and and often it's um, they, they have no crisis management plan or it's uh, it's not tested. It's not looked at. Of course, the last 18 months has probably been one of the biggest crises that the industry has faced. Um, so I know now is probably not the time, but but at a point is just sit and reflect and go, well, how, how did we cope? What did we do well? What didn't we do well? How do we communicate with our guests? How do we communicate with our team? Are we clear on what the decision making process was? And I know this probably may sound um, quite high level for a, for a, for a one off site, but of course there will be lessons. There will be that opportunity to reflect and see how, how you delivered in the last year and what you could do better if faced with another crisis. For multi-site operators um, uh, and ones that I've supported in the past, this will be common language. And we always look to, we pay good money to have a, a crises uh, mock-up and we all sit around a table and pretend that an airplane's crashed into the, the, the brewery or the pub beer garden. Here's a great real life example. So I'd encourage you to use it, look at it, reflect and learn on, on how the business is managed through the crises. The uh, third one is build on adoption of technology. We've seen a massive um, uh, uptake in technology, be it through guest ordering systems, payment systems, menu management systems, uh, allergen communication um, from our business, the adoption of remote uh, checklists uh, and electronic checklists where we've seen businesses who want to see how their many multi-sites, their locations around the country are performing. At the drop of the hat, they can log in, they can look through the, uh, the monitoring module to see if the daily checks are being completed, if the fitness to work forms are being completed. And really for those businesses that have, have yet to adopt technology such as that, I'd be saying you need to, you need to because you're going to be left behind. Um, and other businesses are benefiting from it. For those that have adopted it, is don't see it as being a, an answer just to COVID. This is an opportunity. The guests are used to it. The team are now used to that. So continue that adoption or indeed accelerate that adoption of technology because we've we've broken the back. We've overcome the resistance. A lot of this technology has been there for years. You know, the, the menu management system, the, the, the ordering systems, it's not new. But what COVID did was see, you know, accelerate it by, I don't know, two, five years. So let's make most of that uh, and ensure that we benefit from the, the technology that's now throughout hospitality. And then the last one is, you know, point four is if nothing else, continue washing hands. What we've seen is we've seen a reduction in communicable disease. We've seen a reduction in food poisoning. Now, of course, some of that can be attributed to um, people not uh, being in close contact, not being so close together. But also the, the feedback that we're getting from other countries is, guess what, hand washing stops people becoming ill. Previously, it was estimated about 60% of, of food poisoning um, would could be attributed to poor hand washing. So if, like I say, if nothing else, keep the team washing their hands because it's good for public health. Excellent. So I'm just wary of time. What I'm going to do now is do a really quick recap on allergens. Um, I'm not going to cover this off in, in a huge amount of detail, just to say that there have been significant cases in the press uh, and reported of, and, and in these two cases, young people that have suffered uh, allergic uh, um, uh, an allergic reaction. Um, and often um, when I'm talking to businesses, it's downplayed allergens is, you know, it's a lifestyle choice or 
um, you know, uh, how do I know if it's a true allergy or if it's just a decision they want to not have something in their diet? And the reason that I use these two photos and the reason that we talk about them is actually remember this is people. This is someone's son's daughter, brother, sister, whoever it may be. And people do die from allergens. And, and sometimes we yeah, um, it's too easy to downplay it and say it's an inconvenience. But, you know, as a father with a son who suffers from from allergies, um, my father indeed had allergies and it impacted his ability to recover from illness. Uh, I'm only too aware of, you know, this stuff is real and, and it's easy to dismiss it and it's easy to say it's just too much of a burden on the business, but it does, it, it can either be life limiting or, or life ending. So I'm not going to go into much more details there. And indeed, what I'll do to ensure we've got enough time for questions, I'm just going to uh, skip over this slide. But what I'd like to do is just give a, a couple of bullet points on, on what should businesses be considering on allergen management at the moment. So the first thing is we know um, you're probably all aware that the requirements around labelling are changing in October this year. This is around prepackaged goods for direct sale. Um, and again, the uh, I think of the sandwich that is wrapped before it's sold to the member of the public. There is a requirement there to, to have all allergens, well, all ingredients listed in descending order and then allergens highlighted. So what I'll be urging you now is if you haven't done so already, look at your business, understand if you've got prepackaged for direct sale throughout it. Uh, and if you have, you really need to start looking at what your answers are. And that's looking at labelling solutions. It's looking at your food safety management system. Um, but also about can you change your business? What we're hearing from a lot of people is actually we will no longer do prepackaged for direct sale because that's easiest. But if you're doing that, what are the wider safety implications? So I'd encourage if you haven't haven't considered that yet, um, then please do so. Clear communication to the guest is key. So be that through allergen matrix, be that through uh, your menus. But it's absolutely we're doing a lot of research at the moment around um, root cause analysis. So the underlying causes to allergen cases and what's coming through over and over again is two two areas is uh, the guest wasn't clearly communicated to and the team didn't understand their their needs, the requirements, why allergens are, are important. And that's really, you know, we've talked about the brain drain already on allergens. There will be a lot of um, people joining hospitality for the first time. There'll be new team coming in. It's about making sure that that training is up to date uh, and making sure that uh, and it's easy to say, well, they're just a part time or they're just temporary team as well. Actually, if they're the weak link in the chain, if they're the team member that failed to collect the details correctly, then that, you know, that can end in, in, in really severe consequences. So making sure that all of your team are, team are trained to the uh, required level. Um, be flexible to change. Uh, I've already talked about the bumpiness in supply chains. So if you have a process, if you have an allergen management system, if you have that matrix, is making sure that it it, it is not so um, carved into rock that it, it it's it's impossible to change. So whatever process you're putting in is make sure where there are changes in suppliers, where there are changes in dish, speci dish specifications, that your allergen management reflects that. I've already mentioned, consider the role of team, look through the process, look at ordering, look at communication of uh, allergens to the kitchens, look at the use of equipment and identify the weak links. Again, we can support with that. We do allergen audits, but it's really understanding the performance throughout, throughout the business. Um, I've already mentioned capture changes in spec and ingredients. Again, um, we know we have regulars coming to pubs and they'll come and they'll be eating the steak and ale pie that they've had for the last 15 years or all the fish and chips. Now with changes in specs, changes in recipes, the bumpiness of the supply chain, we'd be encouraging clients to, to ask every single time, have you have any allergen needs? Or even putting it on the menu saying, you know, please, even if you are a regular guest, um, please ask about allergens because ingredients and recipes can and do change. So again, we're through our uh, investigation through our root cause analysis, we are finding cases where they've at the same dish for many, many years, there's been a slight change in the ingredients or recipe, and then it causes a problem. So just find a way of communicating to that to your guest. Um, so they are checking each and every time. Uh, and then the last one I've said there is shown to be robust. So how do you demonstrate? How do you know? How do you go to, to bed at night uh, and, and sleep soundly, knowing that all the controls are in place and that you're doing the very best that you can for, for allergens and indeed any aspect of food safety or health and safety? And that can be achieved through that independent third party audit to, to get that view on your business. Again, it's important you get that view before the EHO does because it gives you an opportunity to improve and, and make the changes that are required. So um, 
I'm, I'm very aware of time. I'm aware I've spoken at you for, for nigh on half an hour now. Um, so what I'll do there is I'll wrap up and um, Molly, if there's any questions that have come in the chat or any comments, then I'll be, you know, it'd be my pleasure to take them. Thank you so much, Rob. I really appreciate you taking the time to run us through all those um, points. I think it's really important to, to note that uh, there's so much for, for pubs and, and people who run hospitality businesses to navigate at the moment. Um, but I think it was it was brilliant that you, you tackled the, you know, speak to your local EHOs, get some advice, don't leave it until the very last minute because that's likely to be where you get some resistance. Um, we do have one question that's come into the chat, um, which was uh, from Martin, um, which is about uh, clarifying the status of recording visitor details within hospitality in Wales. Um, I don't know if you have a, a view or, or um, any knowledge on that, Rob, but from, from my perspective, it's been very difficult for us um, to, to advise on that because we haven't heard anything official either way from um, the government in Wales. The last updates were in May on contact tracing, so yeah. they haven't been updated. Um, so as far as we're concerned, you should still be taking details um, in, in Wales. Um, obviously, you, you no longer have to do that in England. Um, but but as far as I'm aware, it's still it's still mandated for um, hospitality to collect that data in Wales. Yeah, absolutely, it is, and um, we've had some involvements with the Welsh government about this, and and some and, and to and uh, to and fro on it. Um, but yeah, Molly, your summary is absolutely right. So uh, the requirement is still there to collect the details of uh, guest hospitality. There was some question about would it be acceptable just to take the lead booker, um, and again, that's something we saw very early on in the outbreak. Um, but the uh, as yet to, to have anything official write and written down any change um, in the requirements, it is still yet a collection of details in hospitality in Wales as per as per previous. No change there. And yeah. indeed, that, that's the same in Scotland. You, you've seen the, the drawback yes. in England, um, but Scotland has still got their check in Scotland. They've still got their test and protect. Um, and that and, and it is difficult. So there are these whilst they've talked about an alignment between the devolved nations, there's still some disparity. And, and also, um, Martin said, does this requirement remain particularly for an outside marquee? Um, as, as far as I'm aware, and again, Rob, you'll be the expert on this, um, it doesn't matter whether you're inside the pub, inside a marquee, outside in the garden, anybody should be um, who, who attends the premises at all in any way, shape or form needs to have their details taken. Yeah. Absolutely, but I do I do understand Martin's frustration because mm -hmm. you, you are seeing it changing and and nothing is being published to the best of my knowledge, but we have been having these discussions at a high level with the, the Welsh Government and they've said, yeah, it carries on as was. Sorry, that might not be the answer you're looking for, Martin, but hopefully that answered Sorry. your question. Yeah. Um, anybody else got any other questions? Thank you for your thanks for the, for the session, but if there's anybody else who's got any questions, then please do pop them in the chat or, or let us know. Um, if you think of something after the session, then absolutely um, get back in contact with, with us um, here. Um, once we've um, finished this recording, we will be packaging it up and sharing it, as I said at the beginning of the session, online. Um, we will also send everybody who was an attendee or was due to join us today um, a link to that video and also a link to the risk assessment template that Rob was talking about earlier. Um, just a reminder, if you are a BII member, um, then you um, can access the helpline that we run with Shield Safety. If you've got any questions, any queries about any um, element of health and safety, not just COVID, but but everything, um, they, they cover everything for us, then you can get in touch um, on, on our helpline number. Or if you call into the BII team, they'll be able to put you through as well. If you're not a BII member and you run a, a premises and you would like to be a BII member, then we would love to have you as a member. Member. Um, membership is £155 plus VAT for the whole year and you get access to so much help and support. Um, it's literally what we're here for. So it's not just health and safety. We cover all sorts of things from legal and licensing law um, through to general advice. Um, so anybody needs or wants to join as a member, then please do get in contact. Um, and um, if you do have any questions, just reply to the email that um, was sent out to you today with this link for the webinar. Um, and thanks very much to everybody for attending. And thanks very much to Rob for preparing um, a really great session. My pleasure. And I'm aware we, we got through an awful lot there. So apologies if it was done at speed. Um, but hopefully it was uh, it was of interest. And there might be just if, if there's one or two points in there, then that's um, that's a, a, a job well done for me. I'll be happy with that. Absolutely. And Ryan, yes, just to confirm, the, the link for the risk assessment will be sent by email. So that'll take you through to um, Shield Safety's um, website so you can um, get access to that as well as the recording for today's session.
Brilliant. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thanks for taking the time and um, hopefully we'll see you on another webinar soon.